I'll also take the under on on rate cuts. I don't even think we're going to get three this year. Um, there's just no impetus for rate cuts. We've had 247 years as a republic. We've had two very short periods of time where they pushed interest rates to zero right after the 1930s debacle with the Great Depression. And then again, here after the global financial crisis, that's not normal. 4%, kind of where the 10 year is right now, is normal. America has the most to lose, right? And, and I, I just did a, a presentation on this politics and populism. So, uh, and I went through the history of, of empires and, and it's really pretty amazing. They all rise for the same reason, power. They all stall for the same reason, politics. And then they fall for the same reason. Around two weeks ago, Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell informed the House Financial Services Committee that despite January's higher-than-expected inflation data and job report, the Federal Reserve's outlook still favored potential cuts later in the year. However, Powell emphasized the need for additional evidence indicating a slowdown in inflation before moving forward. He stressed the necessity for more data to foster confidence in decision-making, stating that the aim wasn't to seek better inflation figures but rather to gather more comprehensive data. Powell highlighted the current strength of the U.S. economy and labor market suggesting a cautious and deliberate approach to rate cuts, indicating no immediate risk of recession. While Powell's statement was interpreted by the market as a positive signal for rate cuts in June, Mark Yusko, of Morgan Creek Capital, believes such actions could lead to significant economic challenges for the United States. In a recent interview with Anthony Pomano, Yusko shared his perspective on the U.S. economy in 2024 and beyond, delving into topics such as rate cuts, inflation, and the transformative impact of technological advancements on the global economy. Ever feel like you're wasting your money on things that don't really matter? Stop. You don't have time. Don't miss out on this 2025 bull run. Educate yourself now. Don't spend $12.50 on junk. Educate yourself on how to be successful in crypto using our crypto cheat guide. Unlock the secrets of crypto and make smarter investments today. Visit the website now and the link in the description for your exclusive copy. Start your journey to crypto success today. Please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to drop your comment and observations in the comment section below. Thanks and enjoy the video. I, I talk about this, the, the pollution of the most recent period, right? It's like all the data is polluted, right? The data on, you know, price to earnings for the stock market, it's all too high. And people look, at, well, the last 10 years, I'm like, well, but the last 10 years have been above average of the last 100 years. So it's just the data is polluted. And the same thing's true here of, of rate cuts is, or, or, or interest rate levels, right? People seem to think that zero was a normal interest rate. We've had 247 years as a republic. We've had two very short periods of time where they pushed interest rates to zero right after the 1930s debacle with the Great Depression. And then again, here after the global financial crisis, that's not normal. 4% kind of where the 10 year is right now is normal. So this idea that somehow we need to go back to 2% rates just doesn't make any sense to me. You asked a question that I, I didn't answer, right? Is inflation going to come roaring back like the 80s? I don't think so. I mean, we've all seen the chart, right? The big spike, the drop, and then the second spike in the 70s. Part of that spike was a false spike in the sense that they were double counting Volcker's Fed was double counting interest rates in that they were counting mortgages and interest rates. And there was this weird thing. And Mike Green has, has talked all about this in the past. So, so that was the big problem there. So I, I just don't see that happening. And all of this deflationary pressure that you talk about comes from technological evolution. And technology is not growing linear. You know, Jameson Lop put out the thing this morning that, that everybody which is, um, you know, the Kurzweil chart. And it looks like this linear increase in uh, technology and advancing in compute, but it's because it's on a log scale. And, you know, it's one of the things that, that drives me crazy all the time. Remember, see these hockey stick charts? Well, any long-term chart has to be log scale. You can't look at a long-term chart and, you know, you see like the interest payments and they look all of a sudden like, well, that's because you're looking at 50 years. You need a log scale because going from 10 to 20 is you know, worse than going from 20 to 30. 
So all of that says, does Powell look at what's called hedonic price adjustments, meaning if you know technology runs faster or like your your, your washing machine gets your clothes whiter, that you know is deflationary in theory. I'm not quite sure why that is, but um, and okay, so my computer processes faster. I don't type any faster. I mean, I, I still type at the same rate. So I, I don't, I, I know that there's some productivity enhancement in having more compute, but for certain productivity, I, I don't, I don't really see it. But I do think on the job front, on your question on AI, as people get displaced, as human beings get displaced, that certainly will change the dynamic of, of inflationary pressures. My flip side, though, of that, my caution is everyone says at every new technological innovation, this can destroy jobs. And it's true, right? I mean, machines took jobs away from people who were, you know, plowing the fields or assembling uh, things in, in uh, uh, factories. But here's the thing. We, yes, we've destroyed millions and millions and millions of jobs through technology. But today, there are more jobs in the world than any time in human history. Right? That's just a fact. So- We'll, we'll create new jobs, and that will reverse some of that deflationary pressure. Yusko isn't alone in his apprehension regarding the accuracy of inflation data and its deceptive impact on Americans. Last month, former U.S. Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers co-authored a paper delving into the ramifications of elevated interest rates on American consumers. Titled The Cost of Money is Part of the Cost of Living, New Evidence on the Consumer Sentiment Anomaly, the paper revisits an older, more comprehensive method of measuring inflation. Summers argues that this older system, discontinued in 1983, provides a clearer insight into the economic strain Americans have endured since 2022 due to escalating prices. By factoring in personal interest rates and housing financial costs, the authors contend that this approach paints a more alarming picture of inflation than the official numbers reported by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Summers elaborates, highlighting that the pre-1983 mortgage costs and car payments were included in the consumer price index, whereas current price indexes omit borrowing costs. Consequently, when interest rates surged last year, the official inflation figures failed to fully capture their impact on consumer well-being. Summers and his co-authors demonstrate that by reconstructing the CPI to resemble the metrics of past eras, they can account for a significant portion of the disparity in consumer sentiment observed last year. Notably, personal interest payments skyrocketed by over 50% in 2023, yet this critical data is absent from the government's records, a glaring omission long noted by economists. Returning to Yusko's interview, he further explores the economy and advocates for transitioning to a Bitcoin standard as a potential solution to salvage the U.S. and other economies. So when do we become on a Bitcoin standard? Uh, I think it's actually a long time away. And, and the reason is, I, as much as I believe in Bitcoin being better money, I actually don't think anytime soon the nation states are going to abdicate their right to control their particular money, right? And, and look, I don't know if you've ever had Murray Stahl on the podcast. You should have him on. And, and he, I say, he makes us look bearish. Like, how is that impossible, right? But, but he makes us look bearish because I, I talk about this all the time. To me, Bitcoin displacing gold as the base layer of money, easy. Six trillion dollar market cap. That, that's like that's like you you can bank on that. That that's that's totally easy. The next step, which is where the good money crowds out all the other money, and we start talking about to your point, not Bitcoin in dollars or Bitcoin in yen or Bitcoin in euros, but euros in Bitcoin or dollars in Bitcoin because it is the the standard. You know, the the there's a book called the Bitcoin Standard, right? Then, but that's inverse to Gresham's law. Gresham's law says the opposite, that bad money always crowds out good, right? Gold is good money, but other paper money always crowds that out. People uh, want to use the, the, the bad money because I don't even understand the exact, the exact reason for, for Gresham's law, but it's a law, right? And, it, and if you look at history, that's what happens is people flock to the, the worst currency at the worst possible time. And that's why you get the, the hyperinflations eventually. 
Zimbabwe and Argentina and, you know, Turkey. So what, what Murray says is we're going to get a reverse Gresham's law. And this good money, this Bitcoin is going to eat all global currency, which today is about 86, 87 trillion. Oh, just round it to 90 or round it to 100. Doesn't even really matter. Um, trillion here, trillion there. Pretty soon you're talking real money. That one's harder for me because I, I think we've seen how hard people are fighting just on the little stuff as you know, Bitcoin strikes to siphon money out of the banks. Right? We all experienced that with, you know, we saw the lenders pop up and people took their fiat, converted it to stable coins or Bitcoin and got paid interest in a zero interest rate world, which was unnatural. And the banks were like, yeah, 10 billion, who cares? A hundred billion? Now we've got a freaking problem. Now we're going to make it, you know, illegal or unethical or, you know, we're going to put people in jail. And like, there's still people in jail for writing code. It just boggles my mind. Um, so I think there, it's a long-winded way of saying, I think they're going to fight it really hard for a long time. And the smartest people are going to get that and they're going to increase their exposure. I mean, look, you and I have been talking about this for a long time. Get off zero, right? Zero has always been the wrong number. How big that number is in your portfolio, that's, that's a debate. For more Daily Dose crypto news, check out these two awesome videos on your screen. Click now and we will see you on the next video.